January 1998. Saddam Hussein has expelled UN weapons inspectors, and the United States is threatening military action. U.S. forces prepare for deployment. February 3rd. While the Battle of Nerves continues in Iraq, Defense Department security systems report an attempted break-in to computers at Andrews Air Force Base. Over the next two weeks, Pentagon security experts detect similar assaults on military systems across the country. The intrusions seem to be coordinated, and they target computer systems at the heart of the military buildup. Damage to these systems could halt the flow of transportation, personnel, and medical supplies. It certainly was, uh, given its timing in concert with our military actions against Iraq, a uh, wake-up call for many of our leaders, both uniformed and otherwise in our governments, that this is potentially a ve very major uh, threat to our ability to execute our missions. We do an awful lot of work uh, by email uh, and uh, through uh, unclassified uh, transmission of deployment information. Uh, and again, if you take uh, one part of that machine and uh, disable it, uh, you've got a real problem trying to make a deployment operation take place. Although the precise origin and purpose of these attacks is unknown, Washington fears the worst. A joint task force is hastily assembled, bringing together personnel from the FBI, various military services, and members of the intelligence community. So obviously people were worried that this might be an information warfare based attack or some sort of attack designed to disrupt the U.S. responses to problems in Iraq. The intruders are targeting computers that use the Sun Solaris 2.4 or 2.6 operating system, exploiting a vulnerability common among Unix systems that can give hackers an easy route in. Although this flaw in the system and the software necessary to fix it have been publicized since December, Pentagon computer experts haven't focused on the potential backdoor into their systems. Obviously, hackers have. Because of the common vulnerability linking them, the FBI dubs its investigation of the DOD intrusions, Solar Sunrise. Friday, February 6th, more than 2,000 Marines are sent to the Gulf while the search for a diplomatic solution continues. As the military stakes continue to rise, the investigation in Washington is also gaining urgency. Investigators tracing the attacks find the cyber trail leads through a number of foreign countries, including Iraq's Gulf neighbor, the United Arab Emirates. The first priorities were to exchange information, because we have a lot of different entities, and determine what scope of intrusion happened to the different systems. Were there secret systems? Were they unclassified systems? What were the significance of these computer systems? And can we tie it into any sort of attack? One of the first things we did was caution everyone involved that we had been down this road before. And where an attack seems to be coming from and where an attack is actually coming from may be two different things. Investigators track the intrusions back to their points of entry and find they've been routed through a variety of internet service providers, or ISPs. Many of these points of entry are university sites, where security is typically lax, common pass-through sites used by hackers. But at least two of the pass-through sites seem to deserve a closer look. SonicNet, a commercial ISP in California, and AmirNet in the United Emirates, one of the few electronic gateways into Iraq. While AmirNet itself is beyond the reach of U.S. law enforcement, it shows repeated links to a site that is not. Maroon.com, a web page hosting service in College Station, Texas. Without its owner's knowledge, the site is being used as a hacker's launching platform to a wide variety of sites. This hacker's country of origin, Israel. With the permission of Maroon.com's operator, Agents begin consensual monitoring of all traffic in and out of the network. They soon find multiple connections to military sites and hacking activity that fits the pattern of the solar sunrise break-ins. But the basic mystery remains. Who is the Israeli intruder and what does he want? Meanwhile, 
A parallel investigation is following the trail of files stolen from military sites. The most tantalizing lead, a collection of account names and passwords stolen from Andrews Air Force Base and transferred to Sonic.net, an ISP in Santa Rosa, California. The intruder has apparently stashed his stolen information at Sonic.net. If he comes back to examine it, investigators will be waiting. When FBI agents from the San Francisco field office contact Sonic.net, they get an unexpected break. During the same period as the initial attacks on military sites, system managers at Sonic.net received complaints about hacking assaults on Harvard and MIT launched through their site. They have already identified the two hackers responsible for those attacks, local high school kids whose screen names are Mac and Stimpy. Just four days after the first meeting of the task force in Washington, investigators in California are set up to track transmissions from Sonic.net to known military sites. This quickly reveals connections to Andrews Air Force Base, initiated by Stimpy. February 13th, support troops from Andrews depart for the Gulf. That same day, Investigators in California receive legal authority to increase their surveillance of the two teenagers' internet accounts. Under this new legal authorization, investigators can take intercepted internet traffic and actually reconstruct the hacker's online sessions. Concerned for the security of its own network, Sonic.net is also monitoring these accounts. Their combined efforts yield a critical lead an internet relay chat between Matt and someone who seems to be teaching him the art of hacking, a more experienced computer guru with the screen name Analyzer. As investigators follow the electronic trail of Mac's mentor, they find that Analyzer's entry point to the internet is an ISP in Israel. Suddenly, the two parallel tracks of the investigation begin to converge. Is Analyzer the same Israeli hacker who used Maroon.com as his gateway to U.S. military sites? February 23, 1998. U.N. Secretary General Kofi Annan negotiates a renewal of arms inspections with Saddam Hussein. In a matter of days, Washington agrees to the deal. Tensions in the Gulf begin to relax. But on February 25th, a new crisis strikes the Solar Sunrise investigation. The media makes the story public. Well, once the case became public, uh, a lot of thoughts came across our mind. The first one, in particular, up in uh, California, was to get to the sites as soon as possible. If the teenagers hear the investigation before search warrants are served, they can erase all evidence of their crimes. Racing against the clock. Investigators from a wide range of task force agencies converge on a suburb of San Francisco. They reach the two hackers' homes at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, FBI. the same day the story hits the press. FBI, we have a search warrant. When the investigators got to the homes, what they found were computers that were online. The individuals were, were online in chat channels as the investigators entered the homes. Both teens are interviewed in their homes, and both admit to breaking into DOD computers. After some initial hesitation, Mac tells investigators what he knows about his teacher, Analyzer. It seems the kingpin of this hacking assault on the U.S. government is an 18-year-old from Israel. A week after the California searches, a defiant Analyzer gives a cyber interview to Anti-Online, a web-based forum for hackers. He takes credit for the Pentagon intrusions and for teaching Mac and Stimpy their hacking techniques. To prove his claims, he gives a live hacking demonstration, breaking into a military site during the interview. And in an online dialogue with Anti-Online's reporter, JP, he offers chilling insight into his motives. Analyzer's commitment to chaos is real. Investigators recognize his screen name from a number of other pending cases of computer assault. But no one knows his true identity. Pooling their leads, the task force solves this final puzzle. Armed with Analyzer's name and address, 
they take the case against him to Israeli authorities. One of the things that Solar Sunrise demonstrated was that in cyberspace, the, the cliche that, that cyberspace knows no boundaries is absolutely true. Uh, and that we therefore, in many investigations, um, have to work closely with our foreign counterparts because uh, hackers might go through several different foreign countries on their way to victims in the U.S. With the help of Israeli law enforcement, the Solar Sunrise team confronts Analyzer. Investigators search his home, and under questioning, he admits his role in the hacking trails they've identified. This confession is only the tip of the iceberg. Forensic analysis of Analyzer's computer equipment indicates he may have hacked into more than 500 networks. One year later, Analyzer is indicted in Israel on charges of computer crime. Prosecution is still pending. In California, both teens plead guilty to violations of federal computer fraud and wiretapping laws. Both boys are fined and sentenced to three years of probation with 100 hours of community service. They forfeit their computers and are barred from accessing the internet without adult supervision. As juveniles, their legal punishment is relatively light. But this youthful escapade may haunt them in other ways. They're applying for jobs, and they might, of course, want one in the computer security field. When their uh, employer asks them if they've ever been arrested or convicted or involved in any computer abuse, it may have a lasting consequence on their ability to get employment in their area of choice. IBM would never consider hiring a, a reformed hacker. Uh, it would be like hiring a, a, a blur burglar to institute a, a burglar system on your house. You wouldn't do it. In the end, the solar sunrise invasions of military sites proved to be purely recreational. But though no hostile government or group was behind these intrusions, the case clearly demonstrates the vulnerability of the nation's complex information systems to terrorist assault. Uh, all of our plans to prepare for a warfare in the 21st century uh, depend upon our use and leverage of information technology to make our, uh, make our forces more effective. The tools are widely available. Uh, they are at minimal cost. All you need to have is a, is a desktop or a laptop computer and a modem connection, and you are in business as a hacker. A recent DOD study found that Defense Department computers were attacked a quarter of a million times in a single year. At least a dozen countries are known to be funding extensive information warfare programs. But the danger extends far beyond strictly military targets. As the information age advances further, we're finding that more and more government agencies, private sector companies, and individuals really are relying on information technology as a regular part of their daily lives and daily operations. Building on the working partnerships forged by the Solar Sunrise Task Force, NIPC is an interagency effort combining the personnel and resources of the FBI, Treasury, and Energy Departments, the Department of Defense, and the intelligence community to protect the nation's electronically vulnerable infrastructures. The basic mission of the NIPC is to uh, coordinate the government's activities uh, that are directed at detecting, preventing, warning of, and responding to cyber intrusions, uh, particularly those directed at critical infrastructures.